Welcome Chess Endgame fans to the second of two videos examining Rook and Pawn endings that arose in the recently completed 4NCL Junior Online League. Now in the first video we looked at the ending of Rook versus Rook and Rook's Pawn. So in this companion video we're going to analyse the ending of Rook versus Rook and Centre Pawn. Now as ever the position is chosen purely for its instructional value. Every chess player of whatever age and ability makes mistakes, and we can all learn from mistakes at whatever our age and ability. So let's make a start by evaluating the position on the board. Um, well, White is a pawn down, but things are looking uh, pretty good for him. So his king is very well placed in front of the passed e pawn, and the the rook on g6 is not obstructed in any way. It's it's, it's free. Um, to, to range, it can go to a6, it can go to g8, it can go to g1. Um, so this should be a comfortable draw. The Waltzman will go over the moves played, and as you'll see, white gets into difficulties, and what starts out as a fairly easy hold becomes a much tougher proposition. So here, the safest route to the draw would have been to swing the rook over to a6 to the long side of the pass pawn. So black might um, play rook h2 check and white's king could can drop back. Why not play king e1 occupying the queening square? And if black goes e4, then white can play rook a3. And this establishes what's called a third rank defense stops black's king from crossing the third rank. It's, it's also known as a Philidor, after André François Philidor, who discovered this method of defense in the 18th century. And the idea of the Philidor is that as soon as um, black plays the move e3, then straight away the rook moves from the third rank and it can go to the eighth rank. And from the eighth rank, it's in a position to give harassing checks from distance. And so that is a, a cast iron draw. Okay, let's go back. So white did, did go for rook a6 and instead played the move rook g8. Now there's nothing wrong with this move. Uh, it doesn't create any kind of problem yet. Um, I mean, the, the, the e pawn is, is a long way back. Um, on, on e5, it's on the fourth rank, so white is a long way off from, from facing any kind of crisis. But it's just not a good idea to depart from the correct technique. Um, if, if, you, if you play the, uh, the uh, correct technique, then that's the best way of, of staying well clear of trouble. So after rook g8, um, black played rook h2 check. And now white has to move his king to the first rank. If he goes king d3, then he loses because black is able to drive white's king away from the passed pawn. So black can play e4 check. And then after king d4, he goes rook d2 check. And the king is driven away and, then, and that, that's winning for black. So instead, um, white went to the first rank and he played the correct king f1 here. So after king f1, black went king e3. And in response to king e3, white decided to play rook a8. And again, this, this doesn't exactly lose, but it gives black a free move to improve his position. So it would have been better to not give black that luxury. White could go rook g3 check here. And if black's king goes to d2, then white can swing his rook over to a3. And he's, he's cutting the black king off along the third rank. So the black king is no longer able to communicate with the passed pawn. Or alternatively, if, if black goes king d4, then again, white goes rook a3, establishing this third rank uh, Philidor setup again, which, which as we've seen is, is a straightforward pathway to, to drawing the game. But instead, rook a8 was played. And in response to that, black checked on h1. Now there's only one legal move, white has to go king g2. And black followed up by playing the move rook d1. So black has made 
Yes, Black has definitely made progress here. He's managed to drive White's king um, out of the path of the pass pawn. His king has got a good square on e3. And the rook on d1 is able to come to the assistance of the king and block um, lateral checks from distance. On the other hand, White's king is on the correct short side of the pawn and his rook occupies the a file. And that's the best file for the defending rook because it maximizes the, the checking distance. The rook is able to operate across uh, four files. So white is, is, is far from being lost in this position, but it's just become uh, a little bit more tricky for him. So what is uh, white to do here? Well, white did have the option of playing rook a3 check. And the idea of this move is to drive black's rook from the first rank. So the rook leaves the first rank in order to block the check. And that enables white's rook to, to occupy the first rank instead. And the first rank is, is a really crucial rank in uh, rook and pawn endings when, you, when you're dealing with uh, rook versus rook and, and center pawn, as, as we will see as the game proceeds. So if black were to go e4 here, then, um, then white can, can check and go rook e1. And, and after king d4, then white can just go back to, to a1. And white is mounting a successful um, frontal defense. Uh, the, the a1 is a good square for the rook. It's able to go to a4 and check laterally, or e1 and check uh, vertically. So that would have been a, a way of playing, um, playing this ending. But that didn't happen. And in the game, instead of going rook a3 check, uh, white decided to go rook e8, um, attacking the pawn from the rear. So black advanced the pawn. And now white went back, he went, uh, he went rook a8. Um, and again, although this is not uh, a losing move or anything like that, it, it's just not a very consistent move. Um, and if white is going for a strategy of attacking the pawn, well, why not? Uh, why not stick with that strategy? Why not play the move rook e7, for example, maintaining the attack? And if you know black goes rook d2 check, then you know that move is not to be feared because white can just go king f1, and there's sufficient distance for you know, black, for white to be um, maintaining these these annoying um, checks uh, from distance um, from from the rear. So. You know, that would have been another fairly safe way of, of, of holding the position. But instead, white went, um, went rook a8. And notice that rook a8 again um, gives black uh, a free move. Black's not under any, any pressure here. And black improved the position of his king. He went, he went king e2. So let's again take stock of the position. Now, white's rook still occupies this this a file which is very advantageous um, and because of that it's it's possible for white to have gone rook a4 here and if black goes e3 then rook a2 check is possible and it's a similar idea to to the one we saw before if rook, if rook d2 then white can go rook a1 gaining control of the the first rank and if black goes rook b2, well, I guess we can just go rook a8. And if, if black goes rook b1, trying to gain control of the first rank, then white can go rook a2 check. If king d3 happens, then we have rook a3 check. King d2, we have rook a2 check. And if black goes king e1, then white can go king f3 and he wins the e pawn and draws the game. And notice that um, all this is possible because of the, the four files in which uh, white's rook uh, is able to operate. Now, if we switched the, the, the rooks around and they, they, the white rook was on the b file and the black rook was on the a file, well, white's rook would only have three files 
in which to operate, and it would have been possible for Black's king to, to close down the enemy rook. Uh, so that would have posed problems, and it would have prevented White from, from drawing using this, using this strategy. So let's again go back. Okay, so, so White did not go rook a4. And instead, he played the move king g3. And the idea of this move um, is, to, is to go after the e-pawn. But Black had a fairly uh, simple reply. He played e3, pushing the e-pawn. That's what he wanted to do. And now if White had gone rook a2 check, rook d2, rook a1, then the game would actually have transposed into a position that was reached in a game between Friedrich Olofsson, the then FIDE president, and Anatoly Karpov, the then FIDE world champion, in a tournament played in 1977. And it's very interesting to see how this particular game continued from here. Karpov played rook b2, to which Olafsson replied with the move king g2. Now, there's an important principle to remember in, in, in these endings, and it's this. It's OK to put White's king on the same rank as the black rook, provided you control the first rank. In other words, if you control the first rank, it's not possible for black to play the move king e1 discovered check. And that's a move that you have to watch out for. In, in this ending. So after king g2, the only discovered check Karpov was able to give was, was king d3 discovered check. Olofsson went king f1, guarding the queening square. So Karpov went king d2, challenging control of e1. And so Olofsson went back, he went he went king g2 again. Again, it's perfectly safe for the king to be on this square, provided black cannot go king e1, discover check. And he can't do that because white's rook still controls that, that key square. Um, and if black goes e2 here, then white simply has king f2. And there's just no way that black is going to be able to advance his pawn and queen it uh, from, from this position. So instead, Karpov played the move king e2. And Olafsson had a number of options here, but in the game, I think he chose the simplest and the clearest. He went king g3. And after rook d2, then he simply went back with his king. So his king is able to oscillate between g2 and g3 because of his control of this critical first rank. So Karpov decided to challenge Olofsson's control of the first rank. He went, he went rook d1. And notice that exchanging rooks here would, would, would lose. There would be no way for black to stop um, black from queening his pawn. Um, so Olofsson went rook a2 check instead. And the idea of this move is if, if Karpov now goes king e1, then king f3 is possible winning the e-pawn. A similar position to the one we saw in a line a few, a few moments ago. So instead, Karpov went king d3, Olofsson went rook a3 check, and this in fact was an only move. Um, if he'd gone king f3, then that would have been a serious mistake. The idea of king f3 is to try and win the e-pawn by going rook a3 check. But there's no time for that because black can meet king f3 with rook f1 check. And although king g2 attacks the rook on f1, black has a solution. He can go e2, he's defending the rook, and he's threatening to queen the pawn. And that is going to cost uh, white uh, a rook. So instead, rook a3 check was, was forced in this position. Karpov went king e4. Rook a4 check happened. 
Karpov's rook interposed. And now Olofsson moved his rook to the eighth rank, and in, and in this position, Karpov agreed to a draw. And we'll see that after rook d5, with the idea of, of blocking a check on e8 with rook e5, White can go king f1. And if rook d1 check, he can go king e2. And he's going to win the, the pawn uh, and draw the game that way. Because if, if black were to go rook d3, that would be horrendous. Um, because he would even lose. He, the rook would, would drop off. Um, so that's why um, Karpov uh, uh, agreed to a draw at this point. Okay, so after after King G three E three, um, Rook A two check uh, would have would have uh, would have been a a move that draws. Um, but notice that it would not have been an easy draw, uh, unless like uh, Friedrich Olofsson, you're a grandmaster and, and a former candidate. Um, you know White has drifted a long way from the safe ground of the Philidor that he started out with. Uh, and that's what happens if, if you give your opponent free moves in the end game to strengthen his position. Now, in the game itself, White did not find rook a2 check. And instead, he, he went back with his king. He played king g2. And this is a losing move. Why does it lose? Well, because it, it breaches uh, the rule that we've established. White has put his rook on, on his king on g2. He doesn't control the, the first rank. Um, and in consequence, this is this is very dangerous. Um, and Black was able to play King E1 here, because Black does control the the first rank. And after the move Rook E8, Black went E2, and and this reaches a version of what's called the Lucina position. And Black uh, is now lost uh, in all lines. Now the game continued Rook E7. Black went rook d2 with the idea of going king d1 and, and queening the pawn. Uh, and now white came up with uh, with a decent try. He went he went rook a7. Uh, and black has a win here, uh, but it's not a trivial win. Um, he can win by, by retreating his rook to any square along the d file, apart, apart from obviously rook d7, where, where the rook would be captured. So for instance, he could go rook d4. And after rook a1 check, king d2, rook a2 check, king e3, rook a3 check, rook d3, blocking. White rook has to come back to a1. And now black simply goes rook d1, and that shuts the door. Uh, and all white's got left is a, is a few checks. But they're not going to save the game for him because black's king is just going to close down the distance, um, he's going to close down the rook and, and win the game. So rook d4, um, or any other reasonable rook retreat along the d-file would have been sufficient to, to win. But instead, black went rook b2. And this was um, was not a good move. This should have cost black the win. And the reason is it surrenders control of the first rank. So white correctly accepted the reprieve and he went rook a1 check. And after king d2, he went king f2. And he controls the first rank and he certainly controls the, que the queening square e1. So the ending is now drawn again, but the drama was not yet over. Rook c2 was played. White played the excellent rook e1, threatening to play rook takes e2 check. Black played king d3. And now where should white retreat his rook to? Now, sadly, he went the wrong way. Either rook a1 or rook b1 would, would hold. But instead, he made the mistake of going rook h1. Um, and that allowed a very neat skewer. Black played e1 equals queen. 
and after king takes c1, rook c1, the white rook was skewered and, and, and lost, and black, uh, black won the game. Now notice that um, rook g1 would also have been no good here, would also have lost. Black can go rook c8. White goes rook a1, but it's, it's going to be too late. Uh, notice that if he goes rook g3 check, then king d2, and that's also no good. If white goes rook e3, black has rook f8 check, and um, either he loses the rook or, or the queen pawn, or the pawn queens. So maybe rook a1. But then black's got time for rook f8 check. And after king g2, well, there are several wins, but, but the prettiest one and the neatest is to go rook a8. And this drives white's rook from the a file. And now there are only, there are only three files for, for white's rook to operate on. And the problem is that um, the rook can be closed down when, it, when it's operating over three files rather than four. So black can go king c2, and after rook e1, black goes king d2. And if white's, rook, if white's king protects the rook, then black has rook f8 check. And he wins uh, the rook, and then queens the pawn, and wins the game. Okay, well, uh, it was a pleasure to, to analyse this ending. And the Wolzman would like to commend black's play very highly. Um, the new uh, e ECF, English Chess Federation, grades uh, give the 14-year-old the um, player who had the black pieces a rating of 177, um, which, is, which is pretty good. And, you know, the sole slip in the ending was, was rook b2. And that indicates that he had to work all of the lines out over the board, since um, uh, rook b2 suggests uh, that, that he wasn't familiar with this, with this particular ending. Um, so you know he did a great job uh, of improving his position uh, when when he was given the opportunity and thoroughly deserved to win. So what are the lessons uh, to take away from from this video? Well, I think there are there are four lessons. Um, the first one is is good technique. You know that's going to help ensure that an easy draw doesn't turn into a difficult hold or a loss. So you know keep it simple. Um, be aware of um, you know, the basic drawing positions, um, like the filler door, and go for them at the first opportunity. Second lesson is that uh, when you're dealing with a centre pawn, control of the first rank you know, is really crucial. So you know, make sure that you and not your opponent um, control that rank. If you're defending, then your rook needs to be more than three files um away from the pawn on on the long side uh, otherwise the rook is in danger of, of, of being closed down by by the enemy king and then lastly um if your king is on g2 and the attacker's rook occupies the second rank then be wary of discovered checks that allow the enemy king to reach e1 and be mindful of the equivalent squares if you know if we flip the if we flip the board all around. Thanks for watching.